So I guess we're ready to start. The, uh, the topic today is uh, uh, descript, uh, describing uh, data planes using user space policy. Um, my name is Brendan. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some uh, work that we've done um, along with uh, Prem here from, who's here from Barefoot uh, to, uh, we'll, we'll talk about what we're talk about. Um, later on, there's also some other people that uh, I think Prem has a, a different talk, so we'll have a couple different topics, and it's a, it's a buff, and we have uh, actually probably a bit of time, so um, let's keep it interactive. Um, so the work that um, we've been trying to do is uh, trying to answer this question um, in the context of the Linux kernel, uh, with, uh, whether we can describe a, a, a data plane using a high-level language uh, or description of, of some sort, um, and whether we can implement that um, in, the, in the particular use case that, that I have in, in BPF. Uh, and uh, the, the high-level language that, um, that we're using actually is uh, more the, the domain of um, Prem here. So uh, first we'll start off with uh, some All right. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is a like a really short version overview of what P4 is. I'll well, probably anyone here heard of P4 before? Okay. Okay. Cool. Perfect. That's good. Um, I have a few. Oh, this one. That's good. Okay. Cool. I have a few other slides on this uh, in the later presentation, but uh, let's go through this quickly. So this is. These are the three main sections of a P4 program. Um, P4 is a programming language. It's not a protocol, it's not a software, it's a programming language. Um, so there's three main parts to the program. Um, parser, and there's header declarations, and then there's a control flow. So what you see on the right-hand side is like a fairly abstracted out um, pipeline. So there's a parser in the front, there's a multiple stages um, which operate on some metadata that the parser produces. And then at the end of the pipeline, there's a deparser or a synthesizer, whatever you want to call it, uh, puts the packet back together and sends it out. This is like a typical pipeline in a hardware switch. So, like I said, there's header declarations which basically tell um, what the different fields in the header are, you know, what the width is, things like that. And then there's a parser program, which is a state machine, which tells you how to parse an incoming packet with these headers. Um, and then stitching the actual match action units, or the pipeline stages, is the control flow program, which basically operates on some tables, then looking up information that is in the metadata in the tables and then taking some actions which could be modifications to the packet and, and so the packet moves along and comes out here's a example syntax uh, for um, a header declaration here we're showing a metadata declaration it's also a header type um, as you can see it has a bunch of fields um, width of the fields, um, so the, the top is the actual declaration, the bottom is the instantiation. So just to give you a high level overview of what P4 is and how, how the program looks, I think Brandon is gonna go through an actual P4 program um, in a little bit. So uh, then to give a little bit of background on the other piece of this puzzle, so um, BPF, which uh, many of you probably are also aware um, it's a, a, a engine or kind of a, a lightweight instruction set inside the kernel uh, that um, that you can execute instructions. And in the, in the case of networking, there, I mean, there are many different um, places besides networking that you can use a BPF. Um, but in the, net, the networking specific one, you can take uh, SK buffs uh, from different hooks, uh, run the, the instruction set, um, or run your program against each packet and um, you get the use of some kernel helper functions, um, and uh, you're able to interact with maps uh, and, and arrays to 
um, to read and write entries or to use to, to direct the control flow of the, the program. Um, and then to, to send the escape buff out to maybe redirect it or uh, to modify it. And there's also a system call. Uh, so from user space, um, in, this, in our case, was a, a P4 code, code load um, that gets uh, translated into C and then into BPF. Um, and you also have uh, handles to those, those in-kernel map objects that you can uh, interact with and maybe some API that you use to, to expose an even higher level um, access to this. Um, so just a bit of review. Uh, these are some of the um, BPF uh, you know, bits. You get a, a stack, some load storage, uh, uh, function calls, maps, and so on. Um, and you can attach it to various uh, networking related uh, hook points. Um, so in uh, to, to be able to get P4 into the kernel, uh, we have to go through this uh, kind of workflow. And we have some, some tools that, that make this uh, automatic. Um, so you can take a P4 program. In this, in this example, we use a, kind of a pseudo routing uh, program that just uh, does some, uh, some very simple um, routing-like actions. Um, but that gets translated by a, um, a script into a C program. And um, then it goes through some Clang and LLVM. Um, so you, you take the C program and you might rewrite it uh, or uh, mo modify it a little bit to, um, to be ready to, to load into, um, to, into BPF. Um, and then you'll, you'll JIT that into BPF uh, instructions and load that through a system call. So that you can actually do this um, on the fly. And so, Taking these two things together, the P4 program and the, the BPF runtime, um, we would like to uh, be able to define the data planes and to be able to build a um, kind of a, a little network inside of the kernel to uh, to run these customized uh, customized customized uh, engines. And so, in a, a demo that I'm about to show, we'll have um, it's actually a little bit simpler than this. There's not the green part on the right, but there's um, two net devices that will um, be you know, sending packets back and forth between uh, this uh, P4 program that's, that's compiled into BPF. So before I, any questions so far? So here we have, uh, on, the left, on, the, on the left is a P4 program, um, and on the right-hand side is the corresponding C program. So I'm going to switch back and forth these two uh, and quickly go through some of the different parts like I mentioned. So we have our header definitions. So this is a, a v4 only example. So we have uh, Ethernet and v4. And on the C side, we have the same. We have um, a v4 header and uh, down here in Ethernet header. The, the right-hand side was all automatically generated. And we have uh, the... So we just have those two headers, and then we have the definition of our start state. Um, and the first thing we'll do is parse Ethernet. And on the right-hand side, um, we'll come back to some of those sections later. So on the right-hand side, we'll have our parse Ethernet state. Um, we have a couple. So it's a little bit, uh, some of the code is a little bit sprinkled. It's not necessarily um, linear. Um, we have uh, instances of the different header objects that the P4 program wants to keep as it's parsing each packet, which are instantiated here. Um, you'll see a note here that there, there are some things that we can't do in this, uh, this alpha version of the P4 to BPF, which is to, for instance, to uh, calculate or verify checksums. There's a difference in, in logic between how P4 treats packets and how the, the kernel treats and, and BPF treats packets. So um, we'll have to converge on that. That's one of the to-dos I will mention later. Um, so after we parsed Ethernet, we'll uh, parse IPv4. So that will involve extracting the IPv4 header. And uh, we can see the, the generated code on the right-hand side will we'll parse Ethernet. And um, here we see a little bit of the, um, the beta nature of the, the program. So these are the C code that's generated is definitely suboptimal, um, but it works. Uh, and this is kind of low-hanging fruit that we can that will we can work to to improve. 
So this will extract the fields from the, uh, the SKB um, for uh, Justin Soros MAC address, for ether type, and so on. And we'll uh, copy that into a, uh, the struct of the, the ether, uh, Ethernet header on the, that's not, on the BPF stack. Uh, parse IPv4 in the same way. Um, and the, the generated code here can keep track of all the, its offset in a, the way that the P4 is um, meant to understand it. Um, so the other, uh, so at the end of the parser, right, so we'll, we'll have our control flow. So there's uh, um, this pipeline here that the prime mentioned. We'll start with ingress. We have, we have two primary states here, which is ingress and egress. So ingress will first uh, do a, a mapping of port to um, broadcast domain. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take the port mapping. This is a table definition in P4. So we'll, um, this table definition reads the ingress port, which uh, I think happens to be a, like a 16-bit unsigned. Um, so this is the key of this table. And the action of the table is to save the value. So uh, set broadcast domain will uh, keep the, uh, the broadcast domain in, in a metadata header instance. And we can find the corresponding C code. So the C code will look up the ingress port, and um, this does a BPF map uh, lookup, so this is kind of a, a helper syntax to, to be able to look up in BPF tables in a simplified way. Um, and then we'll, we'll save in the, in the header instance. Um, continuing on, so in the, the next table that we'll look up, if we go back to the ingress pipeline, so we'll uh, translate from of uh, the broadcast domain into uh, VRF. So this particular uh, routing program so, um, uh, supports uh, multiple routing domains, and uh, so the broadcast domain will, um, once we know that, we can um, save the VRF index. And the next one is, uh, here we'll do a, a IPv4 FIB lookup. Now, um, the, this is the other major caveat of this uh, uh, preliminary version, which is that um, we only support exact map <coughs> lookups. Um, there's no, uh, I mean, there's already a plenty of FIB infrastructure in the kernel, um, so we don't, there's, there's no need to you know, duplicate that. Um, so, and integrating that would be a, a future work. So um, in this case, we have an exact match of um, looking up the two tuple of BRF and dust address to be able to find the, uh, the next hop um, for this packet. So assuming with, that we find the next hop, we'll take that next hop and do the last thing on the, that we have to do on ingress, which is to figure out which output port to, uh, to send this packet out. So next hop, we'll look up the next hop index and, and turn it into that port. And then the last thing that happens, so we switch to the egress pipeline, where uh, assuming that our next hop index was valid, we'll uh, do a rewrite source desk Mac action and write that into the packet, and then we're done. And we can see here on the right-hand side, we'll go through that same, the same state machine here, uh, translate it into C, so we have broadcast domain. Um, looks like... Uh, so there it is. We have our URF, and we'll take our um, constructor, our key, and pass it to the, the BPF map lookup. Um, so we'll look up on the, um, in that the fib table and say the next hop index if the, the result was found. And on the egress, we'll, or on the last one, we'll do the next hop. And let's jump down to the so if there's a rewrite, so we, there's some, uh, we'll take the, the value from the, the map entry that was found and save it into our um, ethernet, uh, ethernet header instance. And then on the D parser, we'll take all of those, the fields that are um, in all the, the structs and uh, write them back into the packet. Again, this is, uh, some of this is definitely suboptimal. Um, this could be collapsed into a lot fewer writes, or some of these are no ops. Um, and that's pretty easy compiler optimization work to eliminate all of those. 
It actually, the, actually, the LLVM compiler will do it for you. Depending on, it, it does in this specific case. It actually does. I'm pretty sure. Depending on the version, I, I, I've looked at some of the output of this, and it, I don't. Maybe in the way that this was generated. It oh really? Didn't, um, oh okay. So. Cool. Well, let, let's. Yeah. When you, if you have your version that uh, you know, happens to be um, a little smarter, you can share that. <laughs> um, and it, yeah, that's the nice thing for all this. This C code, um, it goes through all of the you know the LVM optimizations. BPF is uh, the byte code that, um, or the 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 backend for BPF that's in LLVM is um, has pretty much or has most of the x86 optimizations available to it. It's very x86 like, um, and so it's uh, the BPF that it spits out will. will it tends to work pretty well. And last but not least, so that program, I just, um, can go ahead and I'll run this on my laptop and um, set up uh, this couple namespaces with, um, we can he see here we have a, a small REST interface where we can um, have an automatically generated uh, REST API based on those BPF table definitions. Um, so that uh, uh, we already have, you know, an API for this, um, and uh, switching to Our namespaces and do our ping. So ping through a BPF program. And so, uh, in closing, the uh, so looking at the uh, different parts of P4 and uh, BPF, um, did find a way that uh, to mix those two. Um, and I mean, it's it's preliminary, but it's it's definitely useful. Um, and there are a lot of some improvements to main. So um, previously, you couldn't do, for instance, uh, any header modifications, and, and that's um, we added that support so recently. Uh, and you know, some of the things that we have to do, so check some support, so to uh, converge on the, the, the view of the world between um, P4 and BPF, um, like that. Uh, P4 has the uh, idea that you should be able to push and pop arbitrary headers. Um, which you can't do with uh, uh, BPF. There, there are definitely some restrictions and, and uh, tricks to the implementation that have to be sorted out. And uh, integrating of the you know the kernel fib data structures with uh, uh, as one of the BPF table options would might be interesting. Um, definitely, the front end needs a lot of lot of work. And it's, uh, many other things. So that was that's what uh, uh, we've been working on and. Any questions or thoughts on that? Yeah, so. <clears> Hi, <throat> Jamal. Hey. Uh, so I, I, I've been having this discussion, so I don't know for the Lexi, but yeah, I, I get it. It's a good programming language. I'm trying to see from the past, the composition part, where you drew, if you go back like a couple of slides, that, right? Uh, <clears throat> Don't mean to be facetious, but what is it that this composition does that TC doesn't do? I, I understand the generation of the code. You know, you take eBPF code and you can generate the different blobs. That's what the LLVM does. That's what the eBPF does. In other words, could this have been generating just uh, TC uh, pass rates or, or par, uh, graphs? So, so perhaps this specific example could have been. Um, but there, there are definitely cases that you can't handle with some of the stuff today. Um, imagine classifying uh, on state using the maps, right? You so, only want to match the, the next packet if it's the packet in front of it had, I don't know, some label in the IPv6 header. But could, like I, that. Could, I, could I have written... Um, RTC prog program that sure, gets sure. injected in there. Um, 
and hand coded uh, how things should be processed, right? So the P P uh, BPF program itself, which sits as an action, for example. So, so P4 sits on top of TC, right? Um, I think you're more commenting on eBPF versus TC than P4 versus TC, right? I, I'm so more, actually it's more P, P4 versus TC, as the TC as the grammar, which is able to describe a graph of. Sure, sure, as, and you can as, take P4 I, down to U32 if you'd like. Yeah, you could, have, you could have output, for example, yes, you could have output uh, U32 classification sure. as opposed to BPF. That, that part I have no problem with. It's the composition, which I think is the basis for P4. I'm wondering what, whether that could just have output a TC uh, uh, script, for example. Yeah, I think for, for that, that should be possible. Um, we'll definitely looking into it. Um, there's, there's a lot of similarities between. Yes, the, there's a lot of similarities is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. Right, so I, I'm not arguing that you can use B, BPF as one of those blocks, or, or, or all of the blocks for that man. It's the composition part. Sure, that sounds reasonable. We all right. Will, yeah. I mean, you want, we'll probably look at it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I would like to go in the same direction as Jamal. I mean, I don't see, in this case, I'm going to talk about TEC, but I'm going to talk about NF tables. And after spending some time reading the specifications and studying this thing, the question is that I don't see anything that could be, could, could be also not done by NF tables, and we already have that thing into it, so. Yeah, I'm not convinced that you're gonna come up with one language that everyone's gonna write in, and it's gonna be the, the one language, right? I mean, we have C and other things, right? I mean, we have enough tables and TC and P4, and uh, I don't know. I think coming up with a universal language is just not gonna happen. I don't actually think it's harmful to have more than one language that sits in front of everything, right? And I mean, another way to look at it, I mean, the. I mean, this is using all the existing functionality. There's, I mean, nothing, no modifications, or actually no, no new kernel code um, used to, to do these things. It's, I mean, it's already flexible, uh, fairly flexible, and I mean, if a user wants to define programs in this way, it's, it's possible for them. Well, I think it's flexible in, in the same, I mean, it's, it's, it's flexible um, as APPF can be flexible because it, it's basically relying on it. And, um, but I mean, what, what is the, the argument to, to bring up with a new way to express a data, data path? We, we have ways to express that into the kernel. I mean, if we are going to push another front end that, that we can basically do with what we have is, I mean, to me, it's hard to justify. It's just another another language, I think. I, I you know, I mean, we could argue about syntax and all that fun stuff, but sure, if you think you can do it with NFT, then you can use NFT's grammar, right? There's one behind you. <laughs> Don't turn it off yet. Performance analysis of this, like how well does it perform? Um, with this uh, this translation, no, we haven't done any performance analysis. I mean, of of stock BPF, there's definitely people have been talking about that all, all week, I guess. Um, with this one, um, no, not yet. And I mean, at this point, I think it's premature because there's, I mean, there's all the low hanging fruits are already there. Are obvious. Um, I have a question about the, um, I think it's maybe two slides after this, the missing features. Yes. Which part of these are missing in BPF and which in P4 in your opinion? Mm. The uh, BPF would be a push pop header and uh, checksum support. Uh, checksum support um, might be doable in different ways, but they, I think there's um, uh, even some 
uh, some thoughts on, on better ways to do checksum within BPF. Um, you know, disregarding even P4, there's, there's already a helper for, for doing checksums. Um, and it's somewhat limited, and I think there is already some, some patches for that. Not for me, though. Um, and the, the table types is, that's, um, I mean, that's just been talked about, so. And I think the, the per CPU hash tables, did they go, those good in? You know, Alexei, if the... It helps performance, though, yeah. yeah. And I think that, I mean, that, that was, I mean, in the P4s. So, so that, I just meant uh, front-end optimizations, right? There's a lot of things you can use to build better back-end code. We get some per-CPU stuff and things like that. So I, I definitely have a use case for pushing or popping headers in EP, BPF independent from the P4 part, so. That's, yeah. uh, that's I, think, I think the biggest one for me would be the in-cap and decap stuff. Right. Figure that out. Also, just yeah, yeah. So when you mention uh, that there is no single language that we will all agree on, to a large extent, BPF is that single language, right? So like looping is is missing there. Uh, but how much is missing, and how much of that is missing because BPF was not used or was used in uh, for unprivileged users, and are uh, restrictions in the language that we're basically willing to let go for these use cases. I guess I'm, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Can you maybe re say that again? Unless you guys Sorry, so, John, you, you mentioned that people will probably not agree on a composition language with which to compose sure. programs with multiple BPF programs. But BPF itself is you know, a very um, expressive language missing some obvious features like loops to what extent is BPF not just that one language that you're looking for if you're willing to? So, so I think that BPF is a little too low level for, for most folks, right? You're not going to write uh, specifications in, P in BPF, right? So, uh, so that I think there's a need for a high level, something higher level, and that's why we have you know the C lang, which you can compile down, right? Which works fairly well. Yeah. I think there's probably room for a, a domain-specific language in the networking side. I think P4 is kind of a first attempt at some of that, and uh, I suspect it'll evolve going forward. So, and okay. I think you might see others too. You know, I don't think that P4 will be the only thing around. Yep. Thanks. Yes. Oh, well, another question. I, I guess you have a piece of hardware that offloads this. Are you planning to take? BPF and then translate it into hardware, some of your assembler code or whatever firmware or however you program it. Yeah. How does that work? You're going to do another extra translation? Yeah, that waits to be seen, right? I mean, right now, if there's a P4 programmable target, you can load the, the data plane description that is written in P4 into the target directly and then manipulate that using the Linux kernel utilities. So that's one way of doing it. The other one is actually doing the hardware offload. Yeah. All right, any, any more questions? Or we can call it good there? So next section of the off? Yes. Me or you? Yeah, you. Okay, cool. Okay. So um, this was one of the ideas um, uh, that was floated around um, to use a P4 program or a P4 pipeline as a backend for switched up. Um, you know, what, what's the reasons for that? Uh, I'll dive into it a little bit. We've done a little bit of work on this um, at Barefoot Networks. Parag is the one who did most of the work. Uh, so I'm gonna just go over what we have done so far. So if you look at any switching um, ASIC, it kinda has a pipeline like this. There's the ingress portion, there's the egress portion. Um, there's usually a parser in the front, the parser at the end, sometimes 
there is no deparser before going to the queuing um, you know, replication engine. But typically, this is how it looks. Um, and P4 maps to this type of a, um, you know, pipeline model. So what's the scope of P4? P4 was actually uh, developed to be used on P4 programmable hardware targets. And that was the main use. So in a traditional switch, you have a fixed function ASIC with a fixed data plane being controlled by a, you know, an SDK control plane. Um, and that's how it looks on the top. Um, and then in a P4 defined switch, it looks uh, like this in the bottom. There's a programmable data plane that you can give the pipeline description using a P4 program and you load that into the programmable data plane and that becomes your pipeline. And then you control that pipeline using a control plane program um, like any other switch. So P4 is not open flow. I think this is just kind of showing the relationship between you know, where P4 sits and where OpenFlow sits. OpenFlow is in the middle. The blue boxes, P4 is actually at the, the switch ASIC or the forwarding plane um, level. There's been some confusion on this, so just thought I'd clear that up. So switch dev and P4. So in switch dev, if you want to control a P4 device, you would like, you should have a P4 driver. So that's the, the whole motivation for this. So sometime in the future, you'll get a P4 programmable chip. Um, you want to be able to com control that using switch dev. And how would you do it? You need a P4 driver in switch dev that, that maps to switch dev and takes the commands and pushes it to the hardware. So since we don't have such a hardware yet, we started working with Rocker and we added uh, P4 support to, to the rocker. So I don't know how many of you were here at the last NetDev, uh, Scott kind of presented this and as a future work, he mentioned possibility of a P4 world and uh, that is what we have worked on. He also talked about an eBPF world, so that's also a possibility. So once you have this support for a P4 pipeline, um, you know, you can, you can load that into Rocker and test it. Um, you can load new functionality uh, described in a P4 program and then test it using switch dev. So it, it, I think it helps in the development of switch dev um, and testing of it. So here's uh, what we did to add P4 support. So there's the P4 worlds uh, support that's um, been done in the Rocker driver as well as Rocker device. Um, it's not upstreamed or anything. Um, it's still work in progress. But we've also implemented a, a P4 pipe pipeline um, that runs in a Rocker emulated device. So this is how a, a Rocker with P4 pipeline will look. You can you can actually connect these ports to Linux, Linux networking stack, and then we actually were able to put the ports that were on OFDPA and the ports that were on the P4 pipeline, put them on a Linux bridge and uh, test traffic between them. Here's an example P4 program that was actually used in, um, in Rocker. It's a fairly simple one, uh, just as, you know, Mac lookup and IPv4 address lookup and switches it. More of that program. So then there is this uh, switch.p4 program, which is supposed to be um, a more robust or a more comprehensive um, description of a top of rack or uh, a spine switch. Um, it has a bunch of features in it. Um, Description for ingress pipeline, egress pipeline. And these are the features. Uh, more features are getting added. It's already open sourced, uh, available on GitHub. Um, 
So on the ingress pipeline, essentially it parses the packet, gets the you know, fields into a metadata structure, you know, maps the uh, input port to an egress interface, derives VLAN, all the standard stuff that a switch does um, you know, on the ingress pipeline. Tunnel, if it's a tunnel packet, do you need to terminate it or not? If you need to terminate it, get the inside headers, put them into metadata, things like that. Standard egress pipeline functions, strip VLAN headers, you know, if the tunnel needs to be decapped, you know, take off headers. Um, if this packet needs to be sent on a tunnel, you know, put on headers. Um, if you need to add any VLAN headers, you know, all the packet mods are happening in the egress pipeline. There's also a host interface. If you want to send packets to the host CPU, you know, you can encapsulate it in a CPU header. <coughs> uh, um, and send it to CPU, or you can receive packets from the CPU and then bypass the whole pipeline and send it out on an egress port, or you can send it through the pipeline, get the normal lookups done. So this program is there. Um, you can actually you know, run this in a simulated model um, and test it, and it's uh, continuously evolving. Uh, it'll be good to have this as a backend for switch dev because it has a lot more features. Uh, so that's part of some of the, the future work. Um, something that we're looking at is how to complete the world support in Rocker, working with Jiri. Um, you know, implement a second P4 world so you can switch packets between two P4 worlds. Um, talked about the upgrading the P4 program. And eventually there will be a you know, P4 driver for chips that talk before. So, question? So, well, this, I look at this and I can see, let's say, a Broadcom switch or uh, the Mellanox switch. It's not very exciting, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess the, it was a proof point that you can actually generate this code. Yeah. So, but if you're to offload this, mm -hmm. you could just use current facilities that are used. Let's say, you know, someone offloads FDBs, ACL, ACLs. Yeah. There's nothing very exciting, basically, that in, in this specific example. Um, yeah, this is just uh, showing. So you didn't need any extra facility, is what I'm trying to say. For this specific example, you didn't need any extra facility than what the mailbox switch would need. Um, if you go back to your diagram where you're showing the offload, yeah. No, I, I mean, the, the more interesting scenario would be where you have loops, for example, or you have um, what do you guys call it when you go back that way? Yeah. Uh, that's kind of different. I mean, a lot of these chips don't support that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the capabilities of the hardware target uh, will dictate some of that, right? Um, I mean, what we're showing here is like, if, if you have a P4 programmable target or a chip, um, that's, that's fine. So it depends yeah. on what the chip exposes, yeah. and it's. Uh, if you go back to your diagram where you're showing how, which one things are off. Yeah, that. Yeah. I, I'm not so. So for that specific example, I don't know why you would need anything that's uh, specific to P4. Right. You could. Are you, you know what I'm saying, Joe? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it does provide you a way to, let's say, simulate your switch before it's you know, ready, right? Simulation the software. Th that's fine, but if you're doing switch dev, what would you switch offload here? You're going to offload... It, it's not like you're offloading right. anything. You already have the FTBs and all the normal... Right. So, uh, so I'll, I'll help Brem out here. Yeah. The, <laughs> the thing that he can do, right, so his limitations are the rocker driver capabilities which today is mostly a L2, a simple L3 device, right? So if you had some cool whiz-bang TC-like feature and the rocker driver implemented that through and through, I guess it does now, doesn't it? I'm looking at you, John. Uh, does, is the TC stuff in the rocker driver as well? No, I, I okay. never added it to rocker. I, didn't, I had yeah. just did it on real hardware. Right. <laughs> if it did, then he could simulate that end-to-end -end with the P4 program that was adapted for it. That's... That's the point. I don't know if, so, like, so, if Jerry, you're not going to add anything to yeah, my, my question is, hardware. do you need anything new, is what I'm trying to say, other than switch dev as it exists with? No. OK. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No. Yeah, Are you going to try to push this to QEMU? 
like all the updates and stuff? Yeah. Is it the plan? So, but I, actually, I want to go back to something John just said. Oh, right. That rocker driver is probably dead. So you want to change this picture. You want to get rocker, this, this slide yeah. in the future, not the driver part, but the rocker device. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the next year picture shouldn't have that block at all, and it should be a exactly. QMU device. The, the next year picture is something like this, right? There's a, there's yeah. a device itself. This, this is the, the vision, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's all I had. Any other questions? Any other topics, comments? It's a boff. <laughs> we solved everything already yesterday. Good? All right, thanks. I think there's some other talks going on in the other room. Thank you.